And now that I've had you all sit down, I'm going to ask you to stand up again. <laughs> This song is actually a special request by Zach Woods. <laughs> Zach loved this song <laughs> so much the last time he was here that we had to play it again just for him. <laughs> Zach, I'm very sorry. <laughs> Never gonna keep me down, I get knocked down, but I get up again, you're never gonna keep me down, I get knocked down, but I get up again, you're never gonna keep me down, I get knocked down, but I get up again, you're never gonna keep me down, I get knocked down, but I get up again, you're never gon
that celebrates life. We are born from nothing and go to nothing. Let's enjoy the time in between together. Sunday Assembly has no doctrine. We have no set texts so we can make use of wisdom from all sources. We have no deity. We don't do supernatural, but we won't tell you you're wrong if you do. Sunday Assembly is radically inclusive. Everyone is welcome regardless of your beliefs. This is a place of love that is open and accepting. We won't tell you how to live, but we will try to help you live as well as you can. Our motto is very simple. Live better, help often, and wonder more. Our vision, to help everyone live life as fully as possible. We are building a community of people in the Triangle who are interested in celebrating the wonder of life and in making the most of the one life we know we have. We have a big assembly like this one on the second Sunday of every month. We also have smaller events so we can continue to build community between assemblies. Sunday Assembly is a global movement with chapters all over the world. This is the mission statement for our chapter of Sunday Assembly. We are a diverse congregation that affirms and embraces our varied beliefs with acceptance and inclusion. We gather to celebrate our shared human existence and to cultivate a sense of wonder and discovery. We seek to exalt learning, propose joy, and promote fun. We want to inspire, share with, and support our members, visitors, and community. And now we have an icebreaker with Kevin. So uh, we're going to start off this red icebreaker. Um, Zach may have us publicly embarrass ourselves later, but we're going to start off easy. Um, so let's all try to find someone we don't know um, and tell them something we did recently that was brave. Uh, it could be something monumental or something really simple, as long as it's something you feel like pushed one of your boundaries in a positive way. So we'll just take a couple minutes and go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
something non-plant and this time I was like I gotta I gotta give the plants a chance um, so one of the things I really think is cool about plants is a lot of people think plants like aren't like nearly as smart as people because they don't do a lot of the same things that we do um, but the truth is they are very intelligent in their own way um, and one of the things that they do that people don't really realize and things that we're only just starting to discover is they actually do communicate with each other, like, you know, we can talk to each other, we have body language and whatever. Um, but plants, in some instances, have a lot of the similar things. So I just kind of wanted to give you guys an overview on that, because I think it's awesome. Um, so, and then, this is always one of, like, kind of like to start with this. So if a tree falls in the wood and nobody hears, it doesn't make an actual sound. So, it's a great philosophical question, yada yada. Um, my excuse was, of course, the sound is always there, it doesn't matter if somebody hears it, it's still generated, kind of thing. Um, so, and like this comic kind of goes through that, you know, these guys, you know, we're gonna chop down this tree, nobody's around, cool, false sound, good. Questions answered, there's an actual sound. Um, so, you know, my, my old excuse was always, of course, sound is always generated. Um, but my new excuse is, well, you're in a forest, so the plants are actually listening. Like, they are hearing what's going on. You know, it's not just people that are hearing this, plants are also taking this in. Um, so, there are kind of like three communication lines that uh, we know of in plants so far. Um, some of them take signals in through the air, some of them take them through the ground, and some of them, we've just come to realize, actually send sound waves. So, like, the true hearing that we would expect from, like, us, like, sound waves going into our ears, vibrating the bones, and that kind of thing. Um, so first, um, one of the cool things is there are these volatile organic compounds that plants will release. So these are just chemicals that they throw into the air. Um, kind of like pheromones, you might think of them as. Um, but they use them to do a lot of different things. Um, one of which is um, they can actually use them to signal danger to other plants. So if something comes along and starts chewing on them, they'll actually start throwing out signals that the other plants around them that can pick up that's basically saying, hey, I'm being eaten, get ready, the monster is coming for you. <laughs> like, you know, the end of times and whatnot. Um, so those signals can go to both different parts of the plant and to other plants, even ones that aren't very well related to it. Um, which I think is fascinating. And there's a whole array of chemicals that we release 
and we still know very little about them. We only know like the tiniest bit. Um, and then one of the other clever things I like about the volatiles is, is they can actually send out signals that will attract something that will eat what's eating it. So in this case, they found that aphids that were eating plants, the plant would send out a signal that would attract a wasp that would actually eat the aphid. So not only are they warning everybody around them, they're actually trying to trick other things to come in and protect them. So kind of like if we had just been like, help, help, you know, like it's their help signal saying, hey, it's either that or they're signaling, oh, hey, there's something good for you to eat here, come find it. Um, so one of the other um, routes is through the ground. So people don't really do the whole through the ground thing because we're not you know, really that connected to the ground. Um, the plants have the entire root network that they have. Um, and so one of the ways they use is they'll actually connect root to root with other plants, both of the same species and of other species. And they can kind of send signals through their roots very quickly. It's also a really bad way to spread disease quickly. So there are plus and minuses of it. Um, but yeah, so they can send signals through those roots. Um, and the other one is um, these uh, fungal connections. So a lot of plants have these associations with um, fungus um, that helps them pick up nutrients and things like that. But what we've also come to know is that they, the networks of fungus in the ground will actually connect plants to each other. And the plants can send signals to plants through that fungal network. So it's kind of like you know, a game of play the messenger or something like that, or telephone. Um, using fungus, which I think is super cool, like multiple species and like it's very complex and we only know so much and they don't know quite how the signals work, they just know that if you eliminate the fungus, like there is no communication anymore, like plants are no longer warned, you know, things don't respond as well as they can. Um, so I kind of think of it as like an intertwined circulatory system. Um, which is, you know, plants kind of have that, like they don't have blood, but you know, they do have liquids flowing and stuff like that. So they just have these vast networks, and so they're highly connected, which is way more crazy. It's kind of like, if you guys have seen Avatar, like the planet one, not the, you know, the cartoon. Um, like, that whole planet was interconnected, and it's kind of like, I don't know, our planet might not be so dissimilar. Like, a lot of these things are very highly connected, which is cool. Um, and then the other one that I think is cool and is more recent is actual sound waves. So what they found is that if they sacrificed some plants and fed them to caterpillars and then recorded the sound and then played that sound to plants that were unaffected by the caterpillars and then put the caterpillars on them, they were more ready for the caterpillars. It's like they already knew it just by hearing, hearing uh, the sound of like plants being eaten the plants knew that they had to heighten their defenses and be ready for like an attack of the caterpillars, which is super cool. It's just like, so yeah, it's just like sound waves. Um, so, however, will playing music to your plants necessarily change these things? We don't really know um, that well. Um, so people have like speculated a lot on this, like playing hard rock to your music, or, or playing hard rock to your plants, does it do anything, classical music? Um, they don't really know, but they have shown that sound waves in some instances can definitely affect the way plants grow, either directionally or how they respond to things. Um, so all of this research is really new, um, but kind of uh, my lesson here is that um, there's always kind of something listening. There's always communication going on all around you. Even when you think it's completely silent, there are signals going on that you can't even sense. It's just, it's in a different language that we don't know. So that's part of why I love science is, in a way, we're just trying to find and decode these languages that we're not sure of right now. And evidently sound between plants is one of them. So, so yeah, wonder more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to read you the poem, In My Father's House, by George Barlow. Always first to rise, usually slipped into daybreak, like a phantom, heading, in jacket jeans, white socks, and loafers, for Alameda, for drowsy traffic, and the buzzing electronics of naval air. But he plays a horn, and some mornings caught him aching with jazz, 
reeling in its chemistry and might. Duke buried Basie, riff chords, changes, softly grunted and mouthed in his closet, in the hallway, in all the glory of the sunrise. Who knows what spirits shimmer neurons and acoustics of his sleep before these mornings. Black Beethoven shunning his own deafness for the sake of symphony. A Haitian drummer, eyes shut in the moonlight, mounted by divine horsemen who flash through his hands. Pretty Billy, eating gardenias with a needle, singing the blues away. Maybe urges older than oceans startle him in the shower or in the living room on his way out the door, compel him to swipe moments from time he doesn't have, to inch notes across pitiless lined sheets that have waited on the piano all night for beat and harmony to marry. On these mornings, he met the man with ease, didn't carry no heavy load. Car horns were trumpets, fog horns bassoons, train whistles blushing, blushing saxophones. On these mornings, he jammed with angels, popped his fingers to music in his head, filled his lungs with cool air. All right. Our speaker today is Zach Ward. He is a longtime friend of Sunday Assembly. Zach is the owner and executive producer of DSI Comedy Theater in Chapel Hill and the artistic director of the North Carolina Comedy Arts Festival. He's been performing, directing, and teaching comedy for more than 20 years. Today he's going to share with us some of the lessons he's learned from doing improv. Please welcome Zach Ward. you to publicly embarrass yourself, uh, and that's going to be a little true. Um, so the first thing, the first thing we're going to do is that we're going to talk. How many people were at the first time that I spoke? Were here the first time I spoke? A handful. Wonderful. So we're going to we're going to do a couple things that we I had done before, and then some new things. So what we do in improvisation is that we live in a world where we say yes unless we have to say no. We say yes unless there is something that is forcing us to say no. So what we're going to do right now is we're just going to practice working on that muscle. We have a muscle inside of us that is, it is possible to get excited. It is possible to be enthusiastic. But that muscle has been beaten down by every job we've had, every argument we've had, and Donald Trump. And, and, and so the muscle of positivity has been crushed and we have to work it out. And so we're gonna try and do that right now. So what's gonna happen is that as an assembly, we're gonna solve a couple of problems. And this is the way it's gonna work. I'm gonna ask for a problem, an everyday problem that we face, and then we're gonna figure out uh, what product might actually solve that problem for us. So for me, um, a problem might be uh, my, all, my, all my cups are dirty, all my glasses are dirty, and I want a glass of water. That's it, all my glasses are dirty, I don't want to wash my dishes, that's a little bit about me. Uh, <laughs> but so I might want a product to solve that problem. So what's an everyday problem like dirty dishes that you might face? Anything at all? Lost car keys. Lost the car keys, thank you very much. Now what's going to happen is that I'm going to ask you a question. Anybody can yell anything out. No matter what you yell out, no matter how silly, how crazy, right? How incorrect it might seem on the surface, we are all going to say, yes, that's amazing, no matter what, right? I'm going to ask you to channel your best OxyClean commercial. <laughs> uh, so uh, this gentleman, Russell, can't find his car keys, so we need a product that solves the problem of not finding our car keys. What's that product? Dogs. Dogs. Yes! That's amazing! Now, dogs exist, so we can't just call the product dogs, right? It has to have a brand name. What's the brand name of this key-finding dog? The key sniffer. The key sniffer. Yes! That's amazing! Now, we don't want Mark to dominate this process. Uh, so, uh, so we have dogs. They're called key sniffers. So when I was growing up, uh, products had a byline. So Nike would be just do it. I grew up rice a -roni, famously known as the San Francisco treat. So this is key sniffers. It has a, a slogan. What's that slogan? Just sniff it. Just sniff it. Yes! That's amazing! 
Uh, this dog is shipped to our house in what way? How is it shipped to our house? Not in a, not in a crate, but what way? Drone. Yes! That's amazing! Uh, what, what uh, breed of dog is it? Schnauzer. Schnauzer. Yes! That's amazing! Now we're going to market this to the public. We're going to do it in an unusual way. Not on, not in a newspaper, not over radio. How are we going to reach the people? Free samples. Free samples. Yes! That's amazing! Which come in like miniature Schnauzers, right? Uh, the samples, we can't give them the full size Schnauzer. Uh, and, and this is going to be, uh, the free samples going to be handed out by a B-list celebrity. Not an A-list, but a B-list celebrity. Who's that? Chachi. Chachi. Yes! That's amazing! And how much does it cost? $19.99. Yes! That's amazing! And whoever said free, thank you for trying. Great. Uh, give yourselves a round of applause. Okay. So this process, this process put into place, what it is, is just practicing saying yes. When someone said, no matter what you, no matter what you yelled out, when someone said, yes, that's amazing, how did it feel? It felt great. How did it feel to seven or eight times in a row just say the words, yes, that's amazing? How did that feel? Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> like, eventually, once you get into the process of saying yes, once you get in the process of being enthusiastic and supportive, that sort of gets you over the first speed bump, and then you're cruising. Right? So the idea of, yes, that's amazing! And you're like, I guess it's amazing! Right? And like you go out into the world imagining that everything is going to be amazing. Why? I don't know, but I hope it is! And then every single thing that is even slightly amazing, you say, yes, that's amazing, and that builds on itself, and there's this like dopamine reaction that happens in your brain that if you are positive and supportive and unconditionally accepting of the things around you, unless you have to say no, it starts to magnify and exponentially create the opportunity for things to occur and, ha and happen in your life. Does that make sense? So we're gonna do this one more time. What's another, what's another problem we might face? Any problem? Carl won't start. Carl won't start, great. Uh, so this gentleman's Carl won't so start, Josh's Carl won't start. What's the product to solve that? Car defibrillator. Car defibrillator. Yes! That's amazing! What are we gonna call it? Clear. Car fibulator? Yes! That's amazing! I see what you did. <laughs> the name was a mashup. Uh, and this is, is, is packaged in what? Not in a box. What is it packaged in? Styrofoam. A what? Styrofoam. In styrofoam. Yes! That's amazing! And what color is it? Purple. Purple. Yes! That's amazing! Uh, and it has a, a jingle. How does that jingle sound? Clear. Clear! Yes! That's amazing! The card of Fruit is just like a one note jingle. Clear! 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 Great. Uh, and what, uh, what famous musical group or musical artist is singing this song? Mario yeah. Speedwagon. Yes! That's amazing! Wagon, I see what you did. Uh, and great. And how much does this cost? One million dollars. One million dollars! Yes! That's amazing! It's odd that it costs many, many times more than a new car would, but give yourselves a round of applause. So here's what happened. Here's what happened between the first time we played that game and the second time we played that game. In the second time we played that game, the amount of time it took for people to answer those questions decreased by half. The amount of time it took for people to get over the idea that they might be judged by the group sitting in this room decreased by half. In the first iteration of this game, which was only a minute and a half ago, we gave ideas to the group, but there was still a voice in our head that didn't believe we would say it was amazing. There was still something in the back of our head saying, I'm going to say Schnauzer, but I'm not sure. And then as soon as we say, yes, that's amazing, oh, Schnauzer was good enough. Right? Even though it was the funniest name of a dog to say. But if we do this many, many more times, how much time will we gain back in our lives just judging ourselves? How much time will we gain back because we try ideas instead of spend all of our day deliberating whether or not the thing we might try, the idea we might share, is good enough for the other people in the room. And this is an interesting thing. 
That's not always a room full of people like we find ourselves in right now. Sometimes we're in a room of people of one. And we spend the same amount of time judging and deliberating and not doing because we are our worst critic. And so before we even walk out the door to go to a meeting or go on a date or go to work or do anything fun, is what I'm wearing okay? Am I going to be five minutes early or five minutes late? Will I be judged based on the, if I'm right on time, is that good enough? <coughs> All of those things happen before we even walk out the door and see another person. And then that negativity just gets amplified in the same way. So I would encourage you to just say yes, that's amazing, as many times as you can, as often as you can, unless you have to say no. Now here are the three reasons you might have to say no. You might have to say no because of budgets, right? If you can't afford a million dollar car defibrillator, <laughs> you have to say no, right? Sometimes you just don't have the money for it. Sometimes our schedule, doesn't allow us to do the things today that we want to do today. So we have budgets, schedules, and the law. <laughs> now this law might not be the law of the land, it might be some moral or ethical standard that you hold yourself accountable to, but these things, budgets, schedules, and the law, those are the reasons we have to say no. To stay in integrity with ourselves and the ways in which we can stay sustainable and supportive of our family, our friends, and our community, budget, schedules, and the law. Every other time you say no is a personal preference that I guarantee you is flexible. And I think the flexibility of those times when we say no and we could say yes, give us sort of the sugar rush of control in that moment when we say no, but then cause us a lot of long-term possibility. I see a lot of people nodding, right, that resonates. And so I sort of appeal to people sometimes to say, if you say no to people enough, what happens to those people? What do they do? They, 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 they stop asking. Or if they're giving you ideas and you say no to their ideas, they stop contributing. Right? And then eventually, even though you find yourself surrounded by people, friends, family, community, peers at work, if you've said no to people often enough, they stop participating, and so even though you may have 20 people around you, you're what? All alone. All alone doing all the work yourself. Because you said no because of a preference, not because of one of these must-haves, and you've said no so much that the people around you have shut down. And so this is what happens. We turn from, I just, I'm on Facebook, we're on Facebook too much, but uh, so this, this article on Facebook about being in France and actually not being able to work more than 35 hours a week, having a month paid vacation, uh, not being uh, allowed legally to work overtime for your job, right? This is like a dream, what, that can't possibly be a thing that happens in the world? It happens. And here Americans are working an average of 47 hours a week. They rarely get paid vacation, it's not guaranteed. And even if they do get paid vacation, they rarely ask for it because by taking a vacation, you have communicated to your peers, your boss, that you're not committed to the workplace, et cetera, et cetera. And so we're just like ground down. And I would ask you to say yes in a selfish way. Because if you say yes, you empower other people. If you say yes instead of no, then people keep contributing. People keep offering you ideas. If you support them, you empower them. If you empower them, they want to do more. If they do more, you have to do less. <laughs> so instead of being alone on the island, surrounded by 20 people who you've shut down, in what areas of your life can you empower people, activate them, so that you get to step back and actually enjoy the one life we know we have? So we don't have to work alone, grind out, because we shut down our team. And that team, I found out today, may include plants. <laughs> so, this is like a very uh, 
core fundamental principle of improvisation, this idea of yes. Saying yes as many times as you can unless you have to say no. But we know this, the world outside of this room is going to say no to us. It's going to continue to say no. People will say no. So the thing that I've practiced more in the last year since I've been here at Sunday Assembly is the idea of resiliency in the face of no. How can you keep, yes, that's amazing, even when other people are shutting you down. <laughs> so we want to stay in this place. So I'll actually ask Jake to come back up if that's okay. Give Jake a round of applause. <laughs> I want to say that like, I love that talk. Unfortunately, it is the only argument that has maybe convinced me to go vegetarian. But now, <laughs> you know, with these plants are sentient beings, <laughs> I don't know what to do. Uh, but, great. Uh, so, you gotta eat something. I, I get it. All right, great. So, uh, so Jake, what's gonna happen is that I'm gonna um, ask Jake a series of questions and I'm going to just tell Jake no. He's going to give me an option, and I'm just going to tell him no. And he's going to have to replace whatever the answer he gave me with a brand new answer. I can say no as many times as I like, and I know based on the enthusiasm of what he had to share earlier, I want you to just give me as many answers as you can. Is that cool? So what's going to happen is that Jake has a box in front of him. It's an invisible box. It's a pretend box. Let's imagine it's the TARDIS. It's much bigger on the inside. Uh, so we open up this box and anything can be in it. And I'll ask a series of questions after. So Jake, I want you to open your pretend box. Um, and I want you to tell me what you see. Uh, marbles? No. Yeah. Uh, a better TARDIS? No. That's a very funny inception joke. And TARDIS is a TARDIS. Great. No. Um, blue shorts. No. Uh, red crayons? Yes, red crayons. What are those red crayons used for? Uh, small children. No. Uh, filling out checks. No. <laughs> uh, writing on walls. Uh, yes, what walls? Of what famous building? Uh, no. Uh, Empire State? No. Uh, Sirius Tower? No. Uh, how about the uh, Pantheon? No. <laughs> Uh, White House? No? It'll uh, be the Red House. <laughs> uh, the Washington Monument. Yes, the Washington Monument. Uh, what uh, famous person watched you do this? Uh, Diana Ross. Sure. <laughs> happens is that when we finally are brave enough, the question that got asked today, when was the last time you were brave? When we finally get brave enough <coughs> to be vulnerable enough to offer an idea and someone says no, then the percentage of confidence we have for our next idea goes down, and then goes down, and then goes down. And I would encourage you to practice as much resiliency in the face of no as you can. Because every next consecutive idea doesn't deserve to be weighed down with the negativity of the last idea that got rejected. So when I say no for a series, this is a this is an exercise. It's a it's a practice. And what's in your box? Marbles? No. Uh, another TARDIS? No. <laughs> Red crayons? Yes. I could have said yes to any of those things, but I'm working on the muscle of. If that's no, then what else could it be? If that's no, then what else could it be? If that's no, then what else, what else could it be? And then celebrate the thing that got the yes. And we moved on from there. But what happens is we get stuck in the no's that we've faced. We get stuck in the no's that we've experienced. And we're not able to celebrate the moments when we do hear a yes. Does that feel right? So every single day, someone is telling you yes. And that yes feels diminished because of the number of no's you've heard that day too. If there's one person who said yes to you, and they didn't say no to you those other times, so their yes deserves all the celebration you can give it. Their yes doesn't deserve to fade into the background because of the people that have said no up to that point. 
but I encourage you to say yes, that's amazing as much as you can, and every single no that you face, which you will face, and they will be many, let them roll off your back so that you can carve out space to celebrate the yes that you will get from people that day, from a boss that really appreciates what you do, from a partner who hears you, sees you, and actually wants to spend every day with you. Let the nose roll off so you can actually live in a space of yes. That's it. Thank you so much.
So Life Happens is the part of every assembly where we share the things that are happening in our lives, both good and bad, uh, things that you want to celebrate, things that are hard, where we need to help each other through. Um, last month we had a huge number of life happenings. I feel like, well, I was very busy time, but in August, I think, uh, a lot of folks are on vacation. I know several people that you, faces you would recognize who are at the beach this weekend, which is fantastic life happening. Um, but we didn't really get any life happenings. <laughs> uh, so if anyone has life happening, they want to come up and share. This would be an excellent time if you want to shout one out. The only one that I have to share with you all is uh, some of you might remember Brian and Michelle. They uh, started this, this Sunday assembly. They did a lot of the work, laying the groundwork for, for what we are today. Um, and then they, they moved right as things were starting to take off. <laughs> they moved to Salt Lake City. Uh, they just, there we go. They're coming in. They're coming in hot right now. <laughs> There's no parts on the table. Um, so Brian and Michelle just bought a house. Uh, so they are settled into Salt Lake City. We cannot get them to come back. <laughs> come back to visit, they promise, someday. But the other big news is that they are starting Sunday Assembly Salt Lake City, and their launch is next month. So they're just going to, I guess, travel around the country and start Sunday Assembly <laughs> everywhere they go. So that's that's big news. They'll be a, a real good sort of sister assembly for us, I think. We're hoping to get to do some things together. Uh, so, other, in other news, on August 10th, Charlotte Northman turned six. <laughs> Do we have any other August birthdays or August happenings? Nicole. Nicole. ages. Uh, and together with other volunteer groups, we sorted 5,500 pounds of usable food for families in need. That's almost three tons, which is incredible. Uh, look for the next food bank day in a couple months. And we are also currently collecting school supplies for the Crayons to Calculators Fill That Bus program. Uh, this program provides basic school supplies and other learning essentials to over 10,000 kids in need. If you brought supplies, you can drop them in one of the boxes at the back of the room. Um, I went a little crazy when I went to Walmart yesterday and bought a bunch of supplies because I don't have any kids and I love school supplies. So it was fun. Uh, we'd love to hear your ideas for any other events or service projects. Um, you can ask Kevin, me, anybody that's standing up here at any point pretty much. You can come talk to us about if you have any ideas for things. And sometimes I'll be like, yeah, you should talk to Heather. <laughs> but I don't know anything. Um, we are not planning any service products for August because everyone is traveling and it's too hot and we're all going back to school. Um, if you have any other ideas, you can fill out a comment card on the way out or again, you can talk to any of us that you've seen standing up here. Uh, we have an all ages board game event on August 27th, which as I mentioned is my birthday. It is a Saturday and that is the 27th. <laughs> uh, and that is at the Chapel Hill Library. Uh, the first game of it went really well. Uh, they said they have a good mix of games and activities for everyone, so please bring your young ones and any games you would like to play. And then next month, we're going to march in the Pride Parade on Saturday, September 24th. This will be our second Pride. Hopefully this one will not be cold and rainy. Um, but if it is, then you get bonus points for showing up anyway. Uh, we did have a great time last year. Uh, anyone who wants to march is welcome. The more the merrier. Uh, 
Um, we also need volunteers to help run the table at the festival. And again, if you would like to do that, you can get in touch with anybody you see standing up here. I say that, but don't actually talk to me because I don't know about it. Uh, or you can go and check it out. Sunday Assembly is run entirely on donations. Uh, we use your, our, your donations for our venue rental, for our insurance, website hosting fees, printing, and any other costs. Uh, if you're able to help, we have several options for donations. We accept PayPal here or through our website. Uh, you can also sign up to be a sustainer and contribute a fixed amount every month, and all of your donations are tax deductible. If you can't contribute financially but can give your time, uh, we can always use help hanging flyers around the triangle, uh, with getting more voices up here to do readings, moments of science, hosting. Um, you can host an event or a service project. Um, just come talk to us. And we also have feedback forms that are available on the snack table, and we would love to hear your ideas on how we can make our Sunday assembly even better. And then our next assembly is right here, September 11th. Uh, this assembly will be about how conversations about mortality and loss can enrich our lives. Our speaker is a licensed social worker with Duke Hospice and Bereavement Services, and it should be a really special assembly. And we've got some final words before our last song and snack time. Uh, if you hit a wrong note, it's the next note you play that determines if it's good or bad. Miles Davis. And now if you guys all want to stand up, we got one more song for you.